What's going on everybody? In this video, we're gonna tackle conditional probability, one of the most important rules you need to learn when it comes to understanding all the different rules for probability. All right, so let's dive right into what is conditional probability. Conditional probability is analyzing the likelihood of an event or outcome occurring based on the occurrence of a previous event or outcome. So let's look at how we understand this. So a conditional probability is asking you for the probability of an event given that another event has already occurred. So again, there's there, the, another event has already occurred, and that's where we get a condition. There's a condition given because of this event that has already occurred. So the notation looks like this. Understand the notation is really important. So we ask uh, P for probability, or percentage, or proportion, and then in the parentheses we see this line. And in front of the line is what we're looking for. Like what are we trying to find the probability of? That's A in this case. Try to find the probability of A. But after the line comes the condition. We have known or we know that B has already occurred. So this is read, hey, we're finding the probability of event A given that event B has already occurred. So if I was going to ask this question in English, it could say something like this. If B has already occurred, comma, what is the probability of event A occurring? Or I could say something like, hey, what's the probability of event A occurring, comma, given that event B has already occurred. So let's try to better understand this with looking at what's called a Venn diagram. So in this Venn diagram, we see two interlocking circles. So the circle on the left here is A, the circle on the right is B, and then the overlap is the A and B in the middle. So these would be two events that are not mutually exclusive because they certainly do happen at the same time, and that is the yellow overlap in the middle. So we have to understand that the entire A circle, the, the entire A circle is the probability of A. Okay, the entire circle. Not, not necessarily just the blue part, but the entire circle A. And then the entire circle B is the probability of event B occurring. Now, um, this is actually kind of worded a little bit wrong. I should maybe change this a little bit. So the blue part, that would be actually very specific. That would be the probability of A and not B, right? That, that's really, really specific. And then the green part, more specifically, is the probability of B and not A. And then the overlap is the yellow part, that's the probability of A and B. So the entire circle for A, that would be the probability of A. And if you think about A, A includes A, not B, but it also includes A and B. And that's why we see the entire circle A that represents all of A, some of which is just A, A and not B, some of which is A and B. So hopefully that makes sense. So where am I going with this? And how is it going to help me understand conditional probability? Well, if we say, hey, what's the probability of A given B? So the thing is, it's given B. So B has already occurred, which means we're looking at this circle right here. This circle is part, this, this circle is the given, because I know B has already occurred. And we're saying, okay, given that B has already occurred, so we know that we're already living in that circle, what's the probability that A has occurred? And that would, of course, be this overlap. So if we think about how to find conditional probability, you take the probability of B, right? And of that B, which is the entire B circle, what fraction of it is also A? Let's let that soak in for a second. So again, the given is that B has already occurred. So we know that you know we're living in that circle. So we could actually get rid of this part right here because that would be A and not B. But we're telling you because it's after this line that B has already occurred. But now we want to find the probability that A occurred as well. And that's where we say, okay, of the B circle, what fraction is also A? So here's what that looks like in a formula, actually. So um, the probability of A on the condition of B would be taking the probability of A and B, that's your numerator, and dividing it by the probability of B. So once again, if you go back to that circle idea, we say, okay, here is the circle for B. And if we know B has occurred, we know that we're in that circle. That's the condition, right? And that's why the B is my denominator, because we know we live in that circle. But now we're saying, okay, what fraction of that circle is 
also a. So that's where we look at the section of the circle that is also a, which would be a and b. So go back to this much prettier circle. We see that if I'm trying to actually find the probability of A given B, I start by saying, all right, my, my denominator is the entire B circle because I know B has occurred. And of all of B, what probability is also A, which would be A and B, and that would be the overlap A and B. And that's why the formula does actually make sense. So to find the um, probability of A on the condition of B, you take your condition, and that goes in the denominator. That would be the probability of B. That's your condition. So your condition always goes in the denominator. And then on top goes both A and B. Now, I'll be honest. Sometimes you can actually figure out conditional probability logically without this formula. But the formula really does work if you're ever in a pinch and you want to make sure you get it right. So let's take a look at a couple examples of how we could use this formula and our logical reasoning to really make sure we get a conditional probability answered correctly. All right, so um, remember when we had this example with rolling two die. So remember when you roll two die and add them together, you can get a sum of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And remember when you roll two die, there are 36 total outcomes, six for the first die, six for the second die. So we say, okay, given the sum is even, I don't know why I wrote that. Given the sum is even and an even number. Well, even, just I don't know why I said that. Given the sum is an even number, what is the probability of getting a sum of eight? So this is a conditional question because there's a given. There's something we already know. So we're asking the probability that the sum is eight, but we're not just straight up saying, hey, what's the probability the sum is eight? We're saying, what's the probability the sum is eight given, that's the line, that's the condition, that we know we have an even number? So we already know we have an even number. So that means that the 3, the 5, the 7, the 9, the 11 is out. We know we have an even number. So that's changing my denominator because my denominator is the probability that we get an even number, right? We already know that's occurred. The denominator would be the probability it's 8 and, remember that upside down u is the symbol for and, and even. Okay, so let's kind of walk through how we would do this. So first, let's do the denominator. What's the probability of getting an even number? Well, that would be a 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, or 12. But we've got to be super careful when we're thinking about ruling 2 die is because how many different ways can this happen? To get a 2, there's only one way that can happen. You roll a 1 and a 1. Okay. To get a 4, that could be a 2 and a 2, a 3 and a 1, or one and a three. So there's three ways that you can get a sum of four. To get a sum of six, you can get a three and a three, a four and a two, a two and a four, a five and a one, or a one and a five. So there are five ways that you can get a sum of six. An eight is a four and a four, a five and a three, a three and a five, a six and a two, a two and a six. So there are five ways that you can get a sum of eight as well. 10, let's see here, that's a five and a five. Um, what else would get us a 10? A six and a four or a four and a six. There's three ways to get a sum of 10. And a 12 only has one way and that is a six and a six. So how many total ways can I get an even number? Well, we just gotta add up the total possibilities. So we have, let's see here, 10, 16, 17, 18. And that makes sense, right? There's 36 total possibilities when you roll two die. And half of them should be even, half of them should be odd. So I should have known it was 18 pretty quickly. But now the numerator goes eight and even. Well, eight is an even number. So I'm gonna say, all right, what's the probability of getting an eight? Well, there are five ways to get an eight. So that would be five ways right there. And there's my probability. Five out of 18 ways. Because out of the 18 options that are even, because I know it's even, five of them are eight. Easy. So if I said to you, think about this for a second. If I said, what is the probability of getting a sum of seven given that it's an eight? Oh my gosh. Given that it's even. Given that the sum is an even number, what is the probability it's a seven? Well, that would be impossible because I can't be seven and even at the same time. Easy problem, right? So hopefully that one wasn't too bad. This one's actually really simple as well. A uh, bag of marbles contains three red, seven blue, 10 green. What is the probability the marble is green given it's red? So I'm asking you to find the probability 
that it's green. I mean, literally the question says what's well, probably it's green, but it doesn't just say that. It says given that we know it's a red marble. Well, okay, so remember I'm using the formula, but in a moment you're gonna be like, why are you using the formula? The answer's easy, but let's use the formula. The denominator goes to condition, because I, I know that the marble's already red, and how many marbles are red? Three marbles are red. Now, of those three marbles, how many are also green? Because that's my numerator, green and red. Well, that's zero. If I know it's red, it can't be green. Oh, there you go, there's my answer, zero. Very, very simple. All right, we could also use two-way tables to make it really, really easy to find conditional probabilities as well. So here we see a two-way table with um, 500 students. We ask them, do they wear glasses, do they not, and what grade they're in. So a student is selected at random. What is the probability the student is wearing glasses given that they're a junior? First, you've got to recognize this is a conditional question because it's a given. The question says, what's the probability that they're wearing glasses? But it doesn't just stop there. It says, given that they're a junior. So the given, the condition, comes after the line. So we say, okay, <coughs> well, I know they're a junior. So the condition is my denominator. There are 155 juniors. I, I know that I'm only allowed to look at those 155 juniors because, again, it, it, was, it conditioned me. It, it, it said you're only allowed to look there, right? It's like I'm only allowed to look at that junior section if I were to make a Venn diagram here, right? Just the juniors. And of those 155 juniors, how many are wearing glasses? That would be the juniors and wearing glasses. Because remember, the formula says my numerator is both juniors and wearing glasses. And that is a beautiful, simple 38. Or excuse me, 32. I'm having a hard time today. So 32 divided by 155 would be the probability of getting somebody that wears glasses, given that they're a junior. How easy was that? So simple. All right, now here's another example with no... no um, no, you know, uh, two-way table or anything like that. But we have probability of family has ham for Thanksgiving. Dinner is 18%. So 18% of families across America have ham on their dinner table for Thanksgiving. And the probability of family has turkey on their table for Thanksgiving dinner is 75%. But, you know, some families have both, turkey and ham. So that would be 11%. So given that a family is having ham, what is the probability they also have turkey? So once again, what's the question say? What's the probability they have turkey? So that's why turkey goes first, because that's literally what the question said. But there was a given. It, wasn't, it didn't just say, hey, what's the probability they have turkey? If that's all it said, my gosh, it'd be 75%, we'd be done. But it says, hold on, given that they have ham. So now we're only looking at all the houses that have ham, because that's the given. They have to have ham. So we, now we say, hey, any house that doesn't have ham, throw it away. We don't want it. We're only looking at the houses that have ham. Of those houses that have ham, what's the probability that they have turkey? So again, using that formula, we just know in the denominator goes the condition. So that's all the ham. So let's see here. We know that 18% of houses have ham. So there's my denominator because that, that limits me, right? I'm using that formula, how easy that formula is. And the, and the numerator is turkey and ham. It is the probability that a person, or not a person, a, a family, a, a dinner table, it has both turkey and ham, which we also know that is 11%. So we're just going to go ahead here and divide 0.11 divided by 0.18, and we get 0.6111. So there's a 61.1% chance that if there is ham on a table, it will also have turkey. How easy is that? Now, I want to kind of um, dive a little bit deeper into this um, particular turkey ham problem with the Venn diagram, just because I want to kind of connect back to what I showed you in the beginning. So let's just say the circle on the left here is for turkey. Put a T there for turkey. The entire circle is 75%. But I'm going to start off with the 11% that we know have turkey and ham. That's going to be my overlap. So if the left is turkey, the right is ham, that overlap there in the middle is the 11% that have turkey and ham. So again, the entire turkey circle, the whole turkey circle needs to add up to 75%. So this portion over here would be 64%. That would be the 75% minus that 11. But this 64% is extremely specific, right? This is turkey and no ham, right? Very, very specific. And then same thing over here on the far right. We know that 18% have ham, so this entire ham circle needs to add up to 18%. So this part would be 0.07. That way the entire circle is 18%. But if we get rid of the 11% that also have turkey, this would be 7% that have ham and no turkey. 
So this is why when we say, okay, what's the probability that they have turkey given that they have ham? So that's where we say, okay, well, oh boy, we're only allowed to look at this ham circle because that was the condition. The condition was they have ham. I'm only allowed to look at this ham circle. So I, 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 my answer resides in this circle for ham because that was the condition. And that's why my denominator is 18% because that entire yellow circle I just made is the 18% of families that have ham. And of that circle that has ham, what percentage also has turkey? And that would be the 11% on top. That'd be the overlap that also falls in that turkey circle. So again, that's when we divide those and we get the 61.1% that have turkey given that they have ham. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. I'm not sure if it will or not, but I like it. All right. Now, the other thing I really want you to leave this video understanding is how to recognize conditional probabilities when they're given to you. Because oftentimes I'll give you a conditional probability and you might not even recognize that it is one. So I want to kind of look through this. So here's a great example. A bag goes through a scanner at an airport, like, you know, security scanner. If the bag contains a weapon, there's a 98% probability the alarm will sound. Well, my gosh, if it contains a weapon, I hope the alarm sounds. But it's not 100%, it's 98%. You know, sometimes, you know, illegal things get through the machine, whatever. But this is a conditional probability, right? Because there was a condition if the bag contains a weapon. It didn't just say, hey, 98% of the time the alarm goes off. No, no, it was if the bag contains a weapon, 98% of the time the alarm will go off. So if I want to write this, this is the probability that the alarm sounds given that there actually is a weapon. Now you can actually kind of take this and think about this as a tree diagram. Tree diagrams are really good ways to understand conditional probability. So if we think about a bag, right? <coughs> now that bag um, is going to either, yes, have a weapon, we would hope that that's not very common or no, it doesn't have a weapon. I and mean, that's probably what's most common when you go to the airport. Now, what we just found was that if there is a weapon, that alarm should go off. And we just found out that that's going to happen 98% of the time. If there is a weapon, 98% of the time, the alarm's going to go off. But we also know from that 98% that there's a 2% chance that it won't go off. So no alarm. So that's condition. Again, this 98% was on the condition that I had to have a weapon. And then the 2% is the, the alarm doesn't go off. Uh-oh, that's a problem when I don't have a weapon. Now, what I don't know, but it does exist, is that there is another tree branch down here where there is no weapon and the alarm goes off. That would be what we would call a false alarm. The alarm goes off, but there's no weapon. And then no weapon and no alarm. That would be another branch. Now, I don't know what those probabilities are, but they do exist. I would assume that no weapon, no alarm would be a pretty high value, maybe like 99% of the time. But there are false alarms. The alarm goes off, there's no weapon. I would hope that that's kind of a low value. But again, what they do give me was that 98% of the time, if there's a weapon, the alarm goes off. So a tree diagram kind of break that down for me. I want to do another one of these. Um, an eagle has two eggs. If the first baby survives, the probability that the second will survive is 15%. Okay, why is that? Well, typically, if um, the mother might not have enough food for both babies, so she's going to feed her first baby, and if the first baby survives, that means the second baby is not getting food it needs, it might not survive. Hope that doesn't uh, hurt you, but, uh, you know, facts of life there, okay? Survival of the fittest. But again, I want you to recognize that this is a conditional probability. It doesn't just say, hey, there's a 15% chance the, first, the second baby survives. It says if the first baby survives, the probability the second will survive is 15%, right? So again, you could think of this as like a, a tree diagram, okay? So you have the first baby, the first baby. The first baby either survives or doesn't. Then we have our second baby. Now, the second baby could either survive or not. And what we just found was that if the first baby survives following that tree branch, there's a 15% chance the second baby survives. Now we get something for free with that. We also know that now there's an 85% chance that if the first baby survives, the second baby does not. 
But again, there is another branch down here. I just don't know about it, but that's what happens if the first baby doesn't survive. Well, the second baby could survive or not. And again, I don't know these probabilities. They'd have to be given to me separate information. Um, but I would, I would hope, again, just kind of logically thinking that if the first baby doesn't, I'd hope that the second baby surviving would have an, an increased rate. Um, but who knows? I, you know, I don't know for sure, obviously. But again, I just want you to realize that you know, when you're given a conditional probability, that probability stems off of something else needing to happen first. That's the whole idea of conditional probability. Let's do one more of these because I really do think these are vital for you to help understanding all this. So uh, there's a medical test for a certain disease. If a person has the disease, there's a 3% probability they will test negative. Well, if they have the disease, they should test positive. But sometimes we get false negatives where they, they, they have the disease, but the test said they didn't. But again, I want you to recognize this is conditional. It doesn't just say, hey, there's a 3% probability of a negative test. No, no, no. It stemmed from them having the disease. So once again, this would be the probability of a negative test given that the person has the disease. But again, a tree diagram is a really great way of understanding this. So if I'm a person, I can either have the disease or no disease. And this branch that I'm talking about is if I have the disease. If I have the disease, there is a 3% chance of a negative test and I get something for free, there's a 97% chance of a positive test. And that would be a true positive. I have the disease, I should have a positive result. But I want to emphasize as much as I possibly can that this 3% stemmed off of the branch that you have to have the disease. Again, that's why it's conditional, right? Something else had already occurred. And just like I did in the previous two examples, there is another branch down here. And I just don't know the numbers, but if you don't have the disease, I would hope you have a negative test. I would hope that that's a pretty high number. And if you don't have the disease, I guess you could get what's called a false positive. It means it says you have the disease, but you really don't. And I would hope that that's a really low number. But I don't know those values. They would have to be given to me as well. I only know what's happening with the branch that I come from. And the branch I'm coming from here is that I have the disease. So again, I want you to be able to recognize these conditional statements when given to you because they're going to be really helpful in you doing some of the mathematics that's needed with these values. But at the end of the day, the most important thing I want you to take away is, is what is a conditional probability and this beautiful, wonderful formula to find a conditional probability that's actually really, really easy to work with if you know how to do it. All right, hope you learned a lot in this video.